Greetings, APW family. It's great to be here with you on our monthly live stream uh, with, with the members. Uh, my effort to communicate directly with you in these difficult times. Uh, greetings from everyone at National Headquarters, all of the elected officers, and, and a huge salute once again to everything you're doing, uh, serving the people of the country in this dangerous, challenging time of the pandemic. Uh, we certainly hope uh, that you're well, that your families are well, your coworkers are well, uh, and for those who have been sickened, and unfortunately for those who have succumbed to this terrible disease, uh, our thoughts are with them, our thoughts are with their families, and I'm sure I speak for uh, everyone uh, on this call. We're going to do something a little different tonight. Later in the call, I've asked our legislative and political director, Judy Beard, to join us uh, to give some update on the legislative landscape. It's very important and it's fast moving. Uh, so I'll keep my comments uh, hopefully a little shorter tonight so we have plenty of time for the uh, questions and answers, your thoughts. Because part of what we're trying to do here is not just to share with you, but to hear from you. Uh, since I started talking about some of the difficult times, let me talk a little bit about the COVID situation. Uh, it's still upon us. The COVID cases are rising in 27 states. The crisis is far from over. Uh, on that basis, the National Union uh, uh, did extend all the COVID MOUs just, just a week or two ago. You can find them all on our website, apw.org. Uh, and that includes the memo from management to the field of the liberal lead policy that enables you together with your coworkers to make sure you protect yourselves and your families. We seem to be in a race between the variants uh, and the vaccines. Uh, the vaccine process has been very frustrating, I think, for all of us. Uh, management in the union at the national level is in concert that we want as many vaccines to be available. Uh, management has reached out uh, to the agencies that are running, the, the entities that are running the vaccination programs. There's 68 separate entities, most states, and then within states, there are counties that everybody's doing something different. Uh, and it's just an indication how weak it is when we don't have a national health care system. This thing can be planned out and it's available to everybody who wants it. Uh, we had hoped to get the vaccines into the workplaces. Management has the same desire. The vaccines are just not available to the postal service in that way. We salute a few of the locals out there have actually worked with the states and the counties and have made those kind of arrangements. We certainly encourage that. We're still working hard at the national level. In the meantime, many of the states now, that there seems to be a rising supply of vaccines. We, we've been clear, we wanna reiterate with you, the vaccine is not a condition of employment. It's not gonna become a condition of employment, but for anybody who wants it, we want it to be available. And it seems as if in many, many states, and certainly the majority of states, the vaccination programs are, are opening, opening up uh, and if you wish to get the vaccine, we certainly encourage you to do so. My own example, I've had both, uh, and I thought it was the uh, right thing to do. Tied into the uh, COVID question uh, is the question of the emergency federal employee leave, EFEL. And in advance, we already got a number of questions on this. So the EFEL is a right that was gained under the American Rescue Act, the, uh, the, the big COVID package that was recently passed uh, under the Biden uh, ad administration, there's a real advance for leave, uh, paid leave, but it's COVID related leave. The problem in the moment is that Office of Personnel Management, which oversees the program, has told all the federal agencies, including the Postal Service, not to put out regulations and protocols until they do. Well, they're dragging their feet. In the meantime, it's the law. So we have asked management and twice they've put out an interim policy, 80 hours at a time. Uh, if you have any problems getting that leave, uh, contact your local union reps. Uh, and if need be, they will push it up the chain and we will address it as quickly as possible. And we appreciate those questions on EFEL leave. Uh, and it's going to be a, a, a positive uh, gain for our members. 
Before I get into the 10-year plan briefly, I just want to remind all of us, we're on the eve of a huge labor fight at Amazon in Bessemer, Alabama, in the deep south. Uh, the results are not in yet. They're being counted as we join together this afternoon and evening. Uh, we certainly hope for victory. But how, whatever, however this campaign comes out, it's an advantage for working people. Amazon is a giant. We know Bezos is, you, you can't even count the zeros. He was making 275,000 earning, not making, he wasn't doing anything. $275,000 a minute, try to fathom that. Takes five, five years of a postal worker. He was making in a minute. Uh, they have run a, a viciously anti-union campaign. And this is our industry, uh, APW family, sisters and brothers. And anytime we can help bring up uh, workers who do the same work we do, and all workers, we all will rise. We, we are in a situation uh, where we're compared to those doing similar work in the private sector. Amazon is certainly has aspects of, of similar work, uh, and it's our own self-interest, and more importantly, it's in the interest of the working class. To break into Amazon, we hope that the labor movement gets a beachhead. We're certainly interested in organizing Amazon as well. Uh, so if you know folks that work at Amazon, you have PSEs who've recently come into the post office that may have worked there, know people, family, friends, talk to them, let us know. What started the campaign in Bessemer, Alabama, Alabama was one person reaching out to a union he happened to know, uh, friends and family who were part of a unionized workforce in the same area that was represented by the RWDSU. Um, let's talk about the 10-year plan uh, that the Louis DeJoy leadership has put out and the Postal Board of Governors put out. Uh, it's important for us to get a handle on it. I call it, I, I, I quote a well-known movie, it's, it's got the good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, on the positive side, they talk about better career opportunities for non-career employees. They uphold the need for six-day delivery and take care of this and take advantage of this wonderful infrastructure that belongs to the people of the country. Uh, that it's that six-day delivery is not just a letter carrier issue, it's an issue for all our crafts because the post office is stronger, our job security is better uh, when we're out here six and now sometimes seven days a week. There's some real plans for growth. Uh, and, and including making room for uh, the increase in packages that were partly there from the, from the pandemic, but fundamentally there because there's a change in the way that, that people are, are shopping, the e-commerce world that we're in, and we certainly want to take, take advantage of that. I'm not going to list all the positives and negatives, but that's certainly on the positive side. Uh, there's also no attacks on workers' rights and benefits at least written into the plan. But on the negative side, they're talking about reactivation of what they call phase two, the plant consolidations and closings. It was an utter failure as, as a plan. It gutted the network of the Postal Service. It undermined service. It slowed down mail. Uh, and we don't see any good reason for them to continue that process. There's also plans to reevaluate Post plan offices, those are the offices in, in, in uh, smaller towns, two, four, and six hour offices in level 18. Um, that's a right they already had. Uh, and it's certainly our right to fight back, and we will, but it happens to, to be in the plan. And then there's this whole idea of taking more mail off airplanes, uh, putting them on trucks, uh, which on the surface, at times you may say, well, maybe that makes sense, uh, but it will slow down mail based on the distance of which that mail will travel. And the APW is very clear that the people of this country deserve what they're promised under the law, prompt, prompt, reliable and efficient services. Uh, the uh, National Executive Board uh, is still in the process of evaluating all aspects of the plan. Uh, we're going to be engaged with the Postal Regulatory Commission because this plan can just not be implemented by DeJoy in many cases. He has to go before the Regulatory Commission. They have to have community meetings, for example, if they want to invoke any more plant closings and consolidation. 
And all that gives us opportunity to weigh in and fight back. And we will be, we've already met with all the uh, craft officers and other leaders uh, on the negative impacts and planning ways that, that we can fight back. And we're gonna establish very shortly some working groups uh, and some advisory groups uh, that will help the national leadership both assess the impacts uh, of the plan as in particular, but not just the negative, but the positive impacts and also ways that we can unite with the positive impacts and we can fight back and oppose the negative aspects of the plan. Look, nobody, uh, most of us on the call are postal workers. We certainly have some good friends that have, I'm sure have joined us for the call and good uh, supporters. No one denies their serious challenge. Mail, mail has changed. There's a, 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 a huge amount of, of problems that have been caused starting with 2006 and the Postal Accountability Enhancement Act, which forced the post office to pre-fund the retiree health benefits drain the post office of resources, led to short staffing, uh, and many other policies of management and Congress that have undermined the Postal Service. But the question is not that whether there are challenges or not. Everybody who works at the post office knows what's happening to the mail. The question is, what are we going to do about it? What's the path forward? Uh, just for your information, we, we, we recently, the, the, the uh, uh, Grand Alliance to Save Our Public Postal Service, at a People's Postal Summit to try to address what are the things that the post office can do to better serve the people of the country, to grow, to expand, uh, and not allow the postal service to go into a downward uh, spiral, uh, and to keep service front and center, to keep center. And I have a very short video I would like to, sh to show you. It's about a minute, just to give you a flavor of what came out of that conference. If we can show it right now, uh, I think they're ready on the, tech, on the technical side. The public postal service is truly a democratic right of the people. For all the things that our founders may have gotten wrong, one of the things they got right was the post office. It is a public institution. It is a fundamentally public institution serving public purposes, this core democratic interests where the ACLU stance on this is. We believe in postal banking because we believe that we need an alternative to these predatory financial services. For Black people in rural and remote communities, the U.S. Postal Service is not a, is not a public service. It's a lifeline. The Postal Service has about 230,000 vehicles. It is a huge fleet and an old fleet. Now, replacing that aging and polluting fleet is a major opportunity to transition to clean electric vehicles. We have a larger challenge ahead of us in terms of reimagining our responsibility and reimagining the work that the post office can do for us as ordinary citizens, those who, those who, who don't have often access. I want to believe that we're all here in the service of that. Okay, so that's a little flavor of what happened at the conference. If you want more, you can go to grandalliance.org and it's posted on that um, website. But in terms of the plan going forward, we wanna be creative, we wanna be forward thinking, we wanna always have service as we like to say and say often. It wasn't called the United States, and isn't called the United States Postal Business. That's for a reason. It's called the United States Postal Service and that's for a reason. In terms of the 10-year plan, we also want to be very careful uh, to not have the plan interfere with the moment of opportunity that we have legislatively, a window of opportunity for, for pro-postal legislation. Uh, and Sister Judy Beard will talk about that a little more later. And also we want to deal, we want the post office to immediately address the service problems. And no plan should get in the way of both of those things, and we will help ensure that they won't. National negotiations are upon us for a new collective bargaining agreement that covers almost 200,000 uh, employees. By the way, that's the largest group of employees that are under, uh, under union negotiations anywhere in the country. So we have an impact, not just on postal workers and, and not just the members we represent and other postal workers. We have an impact on every single worker in this country. Because if we do well, it'll help uplift everybody. And if we don't, it would be a blow 
to everybody. So we have an, we have an awesome uh, uh, and challenging responsibility, which we're glad to be in the fight with. So what's happening with negotiations? Our contract ends on September 20th of this year. We're in a preparation mode. We've had a lot of internal meetings, a lot of information requests to management. We've met with all the craft directors. We have four crafts, clerk, maintenance, motor vehicle, and support services about what some of their goals are. Uh, we've met with the rank and file bargaining advisory committee, which is a, a, a product of the constitution. Uh, and, and the rank and file bargaining committee has input and they also have power to decide whether a tentative agreement goes out to a vote of the membership or not. We have at least 5,000 plus surveys that you have filled out, contract surveys about what's on your mind. And there are many more that have come back in, an, in a digital format, the, the 5,400, they were talking about the written survey. That's great. Uh, we have, weren't able to have a convention uh, this year, a national convention, the highest authority of our union, where we've gotten a lot of input. Uh, so we at least want to hear from you so that the national negotiating team, the national leadership can be weighing some of your issues. For instance, there was a question sent in advance about, you know, what, what are we hoping to do in the, for, for, for the PTS? Well, send us your thoughts about where the problems are. We, we, we certainly think we understand a lot of them, but you may have some ideas that we have never thought about. Uh, so don't hesitate to go on the APW website, apw.org, fill out your contract survey electronically if you can't find the contract survey that went out with all of the uh, membership cards. Opening day will be somewhere during the week of June 22nd. We're still trying to work with the post office to nail down the exact day. We're hoping for June 22nd, but it's not firmed up yet. That's about 90 days out. And that's when negotiations uh, normally and formally uh, open. And we'll have some activity around uh, the opening day of negotiations as well. We've asked all of you to participate in a campaign slogan slash theme contest to reflect what you think the, uh, the uh, main call of the negotiation be. A couple, couple contracts ago was good service, good jobs. Uh, I think the last round was fighting today for better tomorrow. But certainly you may have some ideas of how to bring in into our campaign theme uh, that we've been out there uh, courageously on the front lines as essential workers binding the people of the country together. So we look forward to your uh, uh, recommendations, your submissions to the contest, and you too can also find that uh, it's, it's, it's in the magazine, but you can also find that uh, at the, on the APW website. I mentioned briefly, we didn't have a national convention. I just want all of you to know, like many other unions, including the AFL-CIO, our national executive board just unanimously decided we would have to cancel the national convention. Now, understand that's canceling last year's convention. It was due in August 2020. We had put it off for a little over a year. We just don't think it's safe enough. There's too many unknowns. And the last thing we wanna do is put our delegates and our activists uh, in harm's way. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a heartbreak in many ways. The conventions are wonderful opportunities to build the union. So we will go right to the August, 2022 convention. But having said that, there's a lot of other activities that we're going to continue. There's an all craft conference in the fall that was that we had combined the uh, postponed convention with. That will still go on, but that we'll be able to do virtually. And we're going to have a lot of other activities to keep people engaged from the opening day, uh, a kickoff event probably the night before, a celebration of the 50th anniversary of the formation of our wonderful union that took place approximately a year after the great postal strike. It was really a product of that. So there's, there's many things that the leadership are, is working on, but for those of you who have been delegates in the past uh, un, un, or might've been delegates in the uh, future, un, unfortunately, we will have missed one convention cycle. We did recently sign with management a second new jobs memorandum of understanding where they've added uh, about almost 900 new 
increased staffing jobs to function one, which is mail processing. That's on top of, an, of a previous 5,600 plus jobs. It's a recognition on management's part that, there, that this chronic understaffing and short staffing is making it impossible for us to do our job and serve the people of the country. So we're very pleased with that. Uh, and I am going to, because I promised not to go on too long uh, and just summarize some of the uh, points today that I wanted to address. I would like to turn it over and see what kind of questions have come in. And then in about, uh, about 10 or 12 minutes, uh, I, I would like to bring our legislative political director in for a short presentation and also some questions and answers. So with that, what do we have? Thanks, President Dimenstein. We've gotten lots of questions in advance of the stream tonight, and we encourage everybody to drop their questions or comments in the chat as well. Uh, the first one comes from Bernice in Jersey City, and she submitted her question in advance, but we've seen lots of these questions about the EFEL leave as well. Bernice wants to know if she can use that new leave to take care of her mother. Uh, other folks in the, in the chat have asked similar questions and folks generally want to know when we could expect the, the guidelines from OPM about exactly how and when they might be able to use that leave. Uh, starting with the second point, uh, OPM promised the regulations last week. It did not happen. So the answer is they're supposed to be doing it. They're supposed to be doing it with some dispatch, but it's a bureaucratic uh, uh, government agency and uh, we don't know for sure. Hopefully we'll have some guidance by the end of the week. Uh, in terms of the specific question that uh, Sister Bernice asked, it would depend, at least in my understanding, and take into account that we don't have the guidelines. So don't take what I'm saying to the bank. But our general understanding is one, it has to be COVID related. So if you're taking care of somebody in the family and it's COVID related, then it would, uh, uh, like, it, 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 it would likely apply. It would not apply to a normal caregiver situation for other reasons. And I have to, you know, couch what I'm saying by saying we don't know what the OPM regulations are exactly going to say on an issue like this. Uh, but it is supposed to apply to things like child care issues, with schools closing due to COVID, obviously people's uh, own diagnoses or sickness, uh, if they have it, and that in their family and those who have been exposed uh, and through contact tracing have to have, uh, have to be quarantined. So as soon as we get the guidance from OPM, we'll be pressing the post office to apply those to uh, all of us. And in the meantime, we're in this interim period where we're going in a sense, pay period by pay period until the post office gets more guidance. Great, thank you very much. The next question comes from Jackie in Missouri. Jackie's got a question about the 10 year plan that you mentioned. Uh, and Jackie wants to know how likely is it that Louis DeJoy will be able to make all of the changes in the plan that he's proposing? I, you know, he, he, in many of the things that DeJoy and the Postal Board of Governors are proposing, they just can't do it automatically. Uh, they have to go to the Postal Regulatory Commission for advisory opinions. Other entities uh, and organizations can weigh in uh, with their ideas. People in Congress can certainly legislate certain things. So it's, it's, it, it isn't just clear sailing for uh, the PMG and for the parts of the plan that are uh, troubling, uh, that we feel would undermine service. It's a good thing that he just can't go ahead and do it. Even the plant closings and consolidations. It's been so long since this plan was in effect. They now have to go back and have the input from the communities, uh, a, a new analysis, and that gives everybody time, including the people of the country, to, uh, who support the Postal Service, who trust the Postal Service, to organize resistance to those changes that would uh, limit their, uh, their, their what we call the small d democratic right to Postal Services for all and our universal um, service mandate. So no, you just can't go out and do a lot of it. There's some things they can just under, under management uh, uh, operational issues. But that doesn't mean that we aren't gonna be pushing back and the people of the country aren't gonna be pushing back. And even some people in Congress are not gonna be pushing back. 
So we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll certainly be in touch with everybody. And I welcome any thoughts that people have from around the country on what I call the good, the bad, and the ugly. Well, well relatedly, Tracine from Cortland, Ohio had a question. He, he might see a lot more ugly uh, in the plan than some. He asked, what can the union be doing to undo the damage that's already been done to the post office and the Postal Service's reputation by Louis DeJoy? Yeah, I, th I think that's a really important question. I'm uh, really glad that, that that it was raised. I mean, you know, one, one was our people summit conferences. What can the post office be doing uh, going forward that's new? Expanded financial service. There were even some great ideas about farmer posts, the idea of getting fresh produce into uh, areas where there's no real supermarkets and no healthy food and quality food. And there's a whole organization that has a whole plan around this. Uh, we, we think that some steps have been taken. I think that increasing the, uh, the, the complement, the staffing of the uh, function one mail processing workforce is a step in the right direction. Of the, I mean, the only way we can defend the brand is to first restore service. So that's a step in restoring service. And then two, do those kind of new things that make the people of the country that much more supportive of the postal service. We'll use the post office that much more in so many things that are important in their lives. The other thing that I think is very important is the Board of Governors. The Board of Governors, and you've been all been involved with the petitions, we think it had a huge impact. The Board of Governors sets policy and direction, including hiring and firing postmaster generals. So we, we played a major role, and you all did, in making sure that the Three of the four vacancies on the post of Board of Governors were quickly filled by this new president in terms of nominations. It has to go to the Senate for confirmation. The national leadership has been in touch with the, with the uh, Senator, Senator Peters from Michigan, who heads up the committee that will deal with the confirmation. He's committed to do it as quickly as people are vetted uh, and cleared to uh, um, uh, go ahead. So it's very important to get some more, some diverse, community-minded, knowledgeable people about the Postal Service itself onto the Postal Board of Governors so that, we, so that they can help set policy and we can help influence that policy of restoring the people's confidence. Uh, the brand has taken a heavy hit, uh, partly due to the lack of service and partly due to the, the, the political thrust of the previous administration that railed against the public postal service as some kind of joke and some kind of failure. Uh, and so we have a lot of work to do to restore it. We as the workers can only do what we can do. Management has to step up. And I've, I've told many people, I don't think all the problems we had were caused by DeJoy's policies. I think he inherited a lot of them, but he's the captain of the ship. And he has to be held accountable by the people of this country, as does the Board of Governors, for the problems in the post office and the demands that it be immediately fixed. That's why I said earlier, you know, the 10 year plan is a 10 year plan. We, the service has to be fixed now. One last thing and then I'll, I'll, I'll move on. We also just agreed, we the postal union presidents, there's four, 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 four postal unions that I think most people on the call know. We, we just agreed to call, to, to join a national task force with management to try to address those areas that are having serious uh, service problems. And we hope to replicate, we'll find out this week, uh, later this week, some of what we did with the election mail, where we had local committees, task forces authorized on the clock to address the issues. And so where we're having service problems, and if you're in an area where there's serious service problems, we may not know it all. Send us an email, send us a letter, send us something to say, look, we need one of those committees here. Uh, we have people that aren't getting mail every day, or we're having mail that's sitting here, we're having mail that can't be unloaded in the uh, plants because there's no room. Whatever it is, let us know, and we hope to use that vehicle to try to address some of the service problems, restore the confidence, defend the brand, and move forward. Thanks, President Dimensine. I think we'll make this next one the last question of this segment. Uh, it's a question related to bargaining, and it comes from Charlie in Cincinnati. Charlie wants to know, when will the APWU craft pay grades get back to the same pay scales as the pre-2011 pay grades? Well, it's uh, again, it's another very good question like they've all been. Uh, 
this leadership is dedicated to trying to bridge the gap between the two career pay scales. We have three, we have three pay scales, pre-2010 career, post-2010 career, and the non-career uh, pay scale. So this question is, I think, mainly referring to the pre-2010, post-2010 career pay scales. So there's five less steps in the most prevalent grade uh, uh, level, which, which is six. In the last round of bargaining, uh, we were able to restore two of those steps, one for uh, level five, two for level six. So we have three more steps on the most prevalent uh, grade that we wanna uh, uh, get back. Clearly, it's a goal of this leadership. It's not secret, I'm not giving up anything that management's gonna, uh, they know exactly where we're coming from on this. Um, we, the, the tiered weight for uh, uh, workforces, uh, the, the two tier, the three tier is divisive. It's a race to the bottom rather than a race to the top. Uh, and we were very pleased and proud that we were able to make progress last time. I'm gonna to try to build on that progress to uh, continue to bridge that gap between the uh, top wage scales at least. And of course, just as an addition, it's not just the money we're making today, it affects retirement. It's the money we make when we retire after our hard earned decades at the uh, job. So yes, it's a priority of ours in negotiations. Uh, it's, it's not gonna be easy. Management made huge gains in 2010 and they're not gonna just say, well, here you can have it all back. That's where you all come in, our power, our leverage, our contract campaign to make the demand so managed so we're heard, management has to listen. And if we can't agree to a tentative agreement, then these are demands we take into an interest arbitration process. Uh, so very important question. Uh, again, send us your surveys. We're gonna be organizing around this issue. Uh, we want it to be equal pay for equal work. And we wanna have one career pay scale. And eventually we wanna have one career workforce. Stephen, was that it on the questions? For I think now? that's that's it for okay. now. We'll have time for well, more later. It, it's it, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you our legislative and legislative and political director. Uh, you know, she's not the only one that works hard, but she works hard. Uh, it's a pleasure to work with her. I asked her to come on uh, because we have a lot of uh, important issues and fast moving issues in the legis legislative landscape that both affects us directly as postal workers and also affects the working class as a whole. So without further ado, Sister Beard, thanks so much for joining us tonight, it's all yours. Uh, thank you, President Demisting, and hello Union family. It's good to be with you this, this evening. Over the past four years, there have been a lot of collective action to beat back the threat of postal privatization. Thank you, we were. But today, as we get on the road to strengthening our democracy uh, for postal workers, for our families, for our nation, uh, it's still gonna take a struggle. It's gonna take a fight. And I'm asking all of you to join us. HR1, the For the People's Act passed the House and was sent to the Senate on March 11th. If this bill becomes law, it will make voting more accessible to the public as well as booster the integrity of our elections. And you know that our elections are under attack right now across the country. The Protecting the Right to Organize Act called the PRO Act was passed in the House and it also was sent to the Senate. The PRO Act, if signed into law, it would you make it easier for people to join unions. And you know how important it is for people to join unions, your family members, the community people that you, you, you live around. Um, you know, with unions, we get better wages and better benefits. So uh, I'm asking you to help us with this fight for the PRO Act and the protecting um, uh, the For the People's Act. You can call your lawmakers through our hotline 
at 844-402-1001. And if, if I just said it too fast, I'm going to say it again. 844-402-1001. In addition to that, um, we're planning to join the AFL-CIO with the Pro-Act Digital Day of Action on the 8th. So look for it. We're going to have emails out. It's going to be on our web page. Uh, please look for it. Postal employees saw promises fulfilled when the American Rescue Plan in 2021 was signed into law. And President Demonstein talked about the lead that was so important for you, where the APWU Legislative Department took a lead in fighting for that legislation. And we are so proud that it was signed into law. You asked a lot of questions about the U.S. Fairness Act, and you know that that, uh, that act um, is important to us because it repeals that $5.5 billion that the Postal Service was required to, to pay annually um, in 2006 that passed in the PAEA. Well, yeah. It's back up again because it passed in the House by two thirds vote last Congress. And this Congress, something strange happened. The day it was introduced, it had over 200 signatures bipartisan. I mean, you didn't even have to pick up the phone. It had 200 signatures in when it was introduced. So it's an important bill to pass and you educated your members of Congress so thorough that they remembered and you didn't have to call them and remind them to co-sponsor this bill. So right now the bill has the majority and we're hoping that it move forward and pass in the house. APWU, are, we're currently reviewing something called a draft postal reform bill. And that draft postal reform bill has uh, three major parts. One on service standards, and uh, everybody's mail is late, so you know the importance of improving the service to the American people. It has a Medicare integration part, and um, a Medicare integration part deals with uh, Medicare Part B, and then it has a repealing the pre-funding mandate that I just talked about, uh, the U.S. Fairness Act in it. So it's in a draft form and we're working with the other three postal unions, trying to make sure that the language is, is, is not necessarily perfect, but it won't hurt our members. That's important to us, that it won't hurt our members. Uh, APWU um, uh, you know, members of Congress know the importance of putting, the post office on a sound financial footing. Just this morning, President Biden released step one of his infrastructure proposal. Uh, it's called American's Jobs Plan, American Jobs Plan. And you know, it's important that everybody has a job that want a job and that pays a decent, decent wage. So, this bill, you might have heard some things about it on the news. Uh, beyond fixing our roads and our bridges, Biden's infrastructure plan has language in it for to electrify the federal fleet, including, and it's, this is what it says, including the United States Postal Service. And we were very happy that he listened to us and he put that in his proposal. And we are hopeful that the infrastructure bill being, work, being drafted right now in the House of Representatives will mirror uh, what was in uh, one of the bills that passed, the infrastructure bill that passed uh, last year in, in the House. Mm -hmm. And it included, you know, money for vehicles for the Postal Service tractor trailers for the Postal Service, charging stations for the Postal Service. So th that's important to us. And I've, I was in touch with um, the chairperson over our oversight committee's office today, reminding them that we wanna keep that in the, this bill. We wanna put that in this bill. 
Congress is currently working on an appropriations bill to help uh, provide money for uh, postal financial services like ATM uh, machines and check cashing machines. We've talked about it a lot and it's gaining support. So I'd like to end by saying uh, APWU Legislative Department is fighting for you and I'm sure together we can ensure that uh, the reputation of the Postal Service being the most like federal agency, we can deliver that again. And I was wondering if there are any questions. Yeah, let's hear the questions. Well, if folks have questions for Judy in particular, drop those in the chat. The one we've got queued up right now uh, is a question about the 10-year plan. Uh, it comes from Mary Bodkins, uh, and she's curious about cutting hours in post offices. Uh, on, in a similar vein, Shelby Geyer asks about the likelihood of post offices, level 18 offices, being closed. So, well, the, go I was going to punt that. I was going to punt that to you, uh, President Demistein. Um, the look, we're going to have to fight this out. If management goes through with reducing hours in the post plan offices, which is basically rural America, uh, we're going to have to fight this out neighborhood by neighborhood, community by community, town by town, and we plan to. Uh, if they go through with their plan, I think that they plan to reduce. Some of the hours, like if you have a six hour post plan office becoming a four or four becoming a two hour, maybe in a few cases it would go the other way. But generally when management comes in to reevaluate things like this, uh, they're trying to eliminate hours and eliminate work and eliminate jobs. Uh, it's contradictory to the 10 year plan in my view, uh, because the 10 year plan talks about using the wonderful retail infrastructure to do new things. Well, if you're gonna do new things, let's do new things. And that's our position. And then you can always analyze later the hours. So in terms of 18s, we, we, I would not expect the actual closing of post offices, but I would expect if management goes through with their plan uh, and we can't, and we don't collectively stop them, I would expect some 18s to become six hour offices. Now, the work in the six hour offices belongs to APW members, uh, but it's something we're gonna have to push very hard on. And it's all part of that downward spiral that started under Postmaster General Donahoe, which is you just, instead of doing new things, instead of recognizing the service over the business model, uh, where they just cut hours and cut hours and, and cut hours. They're also cutting some hours, like adding extra uh, uh, downtimes. Uh, in post offices during lunch. That's another way that you're cutting the service to the people that we're pushing back on as, as, as so well. So it's certainly a concern. We're gonna be here. One great advantage of the APW and the other postal unions, but particularly the APW is we're everywhere. So we're in all the towns that are being affected. Uh, and we have the relationships with the people of those towns, the individuals and the businesses. Uh, and we, we, we will wage this on the front lines uh, day in and day out, uh, if, if we have to. So we look forward to working with all of you on that. But and, but that is the ugly part of the plan. I just wanted to share that we we tell everybody we are not a business. We are a service. We're in the Constitution to serve the American people wherever they live, um, and we're going to keep fighting for that. Great. The next question comes from Aaron Brown. Aaron notes that the filibuster is an obstacle to all productive legislation, like infrastructure, voting rights, and possibly even postal reform. He wants to know if the APW has an opinion on ending or modifying the filibuster to allow legislation to move through the Senate. Well, President Biden has said uh, several times recently, he's going to first try to work with both sides of the aisle. Uh, that's real important. But in the end, he's going to deliver for the American people. So we're supporting um, uh, the words that he has said, because his words has been his actions. And if the filibuster ends, it ends. 
uh, years ago, the house had a, a, a filibuster uh, rule that they used and they ended it. And now people don't even talk about it. So if it ends, it ends. But we want, we want to improve life for the American people. And if I can add to, to what Sister Beer just raised, the FLCO was, uh, and I was part of the decision uh, representing all of you on the Executive Council of the FLCO, uh, really challenging the filibuster, challenging its history. It has a history of upholding Jim Crow voter suppression. It has a history of being used against civil rights legislation. And what it really is, is a question of minority rule. Since when doesn't 50, per 50 plus one out of 100 represent the majority? Uh, and so we, 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 we believe that the filibuster is archaic. Uh, it needs to end. Those in power need to be willing to govern uh, and get things done. Um, and so, uh, look, there's no way that the, that the important legislation that, that our legislative political director just reported to you on voting rights, on union rights, it will not pass the Senate with 60 votes. It shouldn't have to pass the Senate with 60 votes. If we believe in voting rights, if we believe that people should be choosing their representatives rather than the politicians choosing the voters, which is what voter suppression does, that they're choosing the voters to keep them in office. All of this stuff needs to go. We need to uphold voting rights. We need to uphold union rights. Uh, and shame on those who now have the, uh, the, the Senate, the House, and the White House if they don't get some of these things done when we have the opportunity. We have a role to play in that, to force the issues, to force the issues forward and say, let's go. It's at the time to be bold. It's the time to be strong. The working class of this country is suffering. Income inequality is galloping. Bigotry and race hatred is becoming something so common. It's sickening and divides workers, the exact opposite of what unions stand for, which is in our unity lies our strength. We gotta get some things done and we shouldn't allow anybody to hide behind a filibuster to say, well, we just can't get it done. And so we have a role to play. Uh, in, in, in defending the basic democratic right of majority rule. Thanks very much, President Dimonstein, Director Beard. The next question sort of bridges both the legislative realm and uh, moves into bargaining. Bobby Broder asks about the move, uh, the movement behind uh, the $15 minimum wage, he wants to know if that is passed, how it might affect clerk wages in the future would they be raised for a competitive working market or stay the same? So what are the prospects for a $15 minimum wage and what would that do to our bargaining position? Judy, why don't you answer the first part and I'll take the second part. Well, uh, it's very important to this country that we pass a $15 an hour wage. Uh, people are right now working for $7 an uh, hour and, and, and it's not enough to feed their family. It's not enough to pay their bills. Uh, so $15 an hour is important to the people of this country. Uh, I started my presentation by saying that um, it's, you know, this is a, a time for us to strengthen our democracy. Uh, in order to strengthen our democracy, we have to pay people fair wages. And it does tie into uh, collective bargaining. Under the Postal Reorganization Act of 1970, uh, postal workers are supposed to be compared to those doing similar work in the private sector uh, in terms of wages and benefits. When that law was passed, it was bringing us up. Now it's used by management, which is taking out of context, taking the intent of the law out of context. It wasn't an idea that we go down and we get pushed down to a lower floor, but it's used that. Anything we can do as postal workers to uplift all workers helps us at the bargaining table. Uh, and again, I, my button that I love to wear, workers deserve respect. 
By the way, that came out of uh, our accountability day struggles against abusive management decades ago. We still have that ongoing struggle. Uh, workers deserve respect. Living wages is the basic respect. $15 an hour as a minimum wage may be hardly there, but it's a huge advance. Uh, if the minimum wage were kept up with just with inflation, it would be around $14 an hour. So you see how workers have been pushed back. Uh, and it's very important that uh, all workers are uplifted. That's the goal and, and the aim of, of, of the labor movement, if we're worth our, our name. Uh, but it does have an impact at the bargaining table itself. And we were disappointed. I think I'm speaking for Judy Beard as well. We, we, we were disappointed in the American Rescue Plan that it was stripped out by one unelected parliamentarian. Uh, so it did not get into the package as uh, Senator Sanders, uh, who's really at least in the elected official realm, has really led on this question for a number of years now, and others had uh, won. So we're going to have to find other ways, uh, and we'll be calling upon you as, as, as union members and friends and allies to continue to fight to make sure that the minimum wage uh, is uplifted to at least $15 an hour, tied to future inflation. Uh, and that's important for all of us, including those of us who are already unionized and those of us who make more than $15 an hour. Great, thanks very much. The next question comes from Jonathan Gatto. He asks a question of Judy, he wants to know how can we get the bill passed to remove the pre-funding mandate? And then he also asks what the union thinks about shipping uh, liquor and postal banking. Okay, um, the, I'm gonna answer the uh, second question first and thank you for, for both of those questions. Uh, the, there has been legislation introduced uh, in the house over the years uh, so that the post office can can uh, mail liquor and is it it was reintroduced in this congress and uh, it has a lot of support the uh, question concerning uh, your first issue was you know what are we going to do to uh, get this us fairness act uh, passed it already has the majority of the people in the House uh, to repeal the uh, PAEA, Postal Accountability and Enhancement Act, that $5.5 billion. And it was introduced, coordinated with the Senate by, um, by a Republican senator. So it has bipartisan support. So we're just going to, you know, work the bill as we did. In, in the last Congress, um, get the bill on the floor and in the House and get the bill on the floor in the Senate. But it's also that same language is included in a postal reform bill. So there's a lot of effort being made right now to get that bill passed. Has the majority already in the House and it's bipartisan. And that's, that's a great start. And you notice how many times Judy Beard said bipartisan, it's vital. And one of the great things about our union, we represent the whole political spectrum. We respect that. And we can use that as a source of strength to bring on everybody from all sides of the aisle uh, around pro-postal, pro-worker legislation. So you, they all need to hear from you. Uh, and so keep up the good work. We have a really interesting question next. It comes from David Yao, who notes that Steve Kearney, who is now the head of the Nonprofit Mailers Alliance and a former postal official, has recently proposed that Congress ought to subsidize the Postal Service to offset the cost of the universal service obligation, so-called unprofitable rural areas, etc. Is the idea of a congressional subsidy for the USO gaining any traction? Well, it's a very interesting question and point. Uh, I think it's worth the union thinking very hard about how we should deal with this issue and how we should promote the issue. 1970 was the law that created the self-sustaining postal service, meaning we don't have any tax dollars uh, and we have to have enough revenue to carry out our universal service mission, accepting, transporting, sorting, delivering 
mail and all types of mail. That includes packages. So 161 and growing addresses uh, every, uh, every day. And sometimes now, not just six, but sometimes seven days a week. In 1970, there was no internet. And so I think it's a legitimate discussion and what Mr. Kearney has raised should be thought about very seriously because there's downsides to appropriations and whether you have to fight for it every year and how it gets done and whether it's used to stranglehold us. But the upside, at least to consider, is if there's not enough revenue because of changing mail, and some of that's based on policies that the post office has implemented, some of it's based on policies that Congress has implemented, such as creating this financial crisis with the 2006 Postal, Postal Accountability Enhancement Act. But I think it's fair enough. The people of the country trust and support the Postal Service. Would all the things that tax dollars go to, do you think anybody would not feel that it's a good expense of tax dollars to make sure that they still have universal service? I think it's really a discussion that we need to have. In terms of Dave's specific question about traction, I'm not sure what the answer is. I don't know if it's gaining any traction or not. And we also wanna be very open to other ideas of generating finances due to the diversion of mail uh, and bill paying and other things onto the um, uh, internet. So I'm glad that it's been raised and it's out there. I think we have to have a very honest discussion and be very proactive about it. Uh, but let's, let's also take into account that times change. Uh, and it's a very different world than 1970 right now. Great, thanks very much. And we're coming up on the hour. So this next question may be the last, but it comes from Jonathan Smith. I think Jonathan's reacting to the uh, the legislation that's happening in state houses across the country with respect to voter suppression. He wants to know if the APW will boycott any conferences or conventions in states that pass voter suppression legislation. And maybe if you just want to address uh, that that movement to crack down on the right to vote across the country uh, and how APW members can get involved in that fight as well. Judy, you want to take the first crack? I'll take the first crack. Thank you, Jonathan, uh, for that question. Uh, we haven't had any discussion about a national movement or a national campaign to boycott. We'll certainly talk to our APWU members in those prospective states uh, across the country to see how they feel. Uh, certainly the AFL-CIO is all across the country and we'll take a, a very serious look at it. But we do know that if HR1 becomes law, it will wipe out those negative, very bad, uh, you know, things that are occurring in the election process across the country to prevent us from voting. We know that HR1 will wipe them out. It will end them because it will be a national law. And we're going to continue to fight very hard for that national law. Now I'm going to kick it to President Devastating. So, uh, thanks, Judy, and, and thanks for that question, uh, Jonathan. One is, just so everybody knows the scope, there's now over 250 new voter suppression laws and counting in 43 states as a reaction to this last election and a reaction to the success of vote by mail and election mail. We are at an intersection of uh, postal workers and a union that is upholds on a nonpartisan basis as part of our civic pride and duty and uh, uh, enabling tens of millions of people to have access to the ballot box, that cherished and hard fought right to vote. So the question that Jonathan has put to us is extremely important. We need to be involved at, at every state where we have members in fighting back against this voter suppression, which will have impact on everything that we face uh, down the road. Um, and so the question of boycotts is very interesting. We, uh, Judy's right that we haven't had a discussion of that. I'm glad you're putting it on our plate. I would think that with those kind of things, we would also want to be working with the civil rights uh, communities, with the rest of the labor community, uh, so that these things are, are, are organized in a broader and stronger way. 
But I think that would be a terrific response to punish these states economically uh, who dare. And I don't agree with Biden on everything, and we can discuss that maybe in another call. But he called the voting rights, the, the voter suppression law that just passed in Georgia, not voting rights, it's the opposite. He called it an atrocity, I think, were his words. He's absolutely right. It's an atrocity. It's an insult. And to come back and deal with that state and deal with it economically, uh, I think is uh, right on. So I very much appreciate those uh, thoughts and that question. Would you like to do one more we question? Time. We got time for any more questions or we time to wrap it up? We, we can do one, one final question. Uh, this is one we got before the show. It comes from Tony in Alexandria, Virginia, uh, wanting to know about when will postal workers get shots and can we expect the COVID MOUs to be extended uh, for another round after this latest extension? Okay. so. As I reported earlier, we have extended the COVID MOUs till June 4th. We will take another look two, three weeks before June 4th to see what's uh, needed at that time. And of course, we're negotiating with management so we don't tangle by ourselves. Uh, um, so, but we're, we're pleased that they're extended in, in this period. Uh, it's, a, it's still a troubling, fast moving situation with COVID and the vaccination ties in. In terms of the vaccination right now, we're still trying to work with headquarters. Headquarters management is still trying to work with the government entities, the 68 separate entities that make this so chaotic uh, uh, in terms of getting some, some uh, shots uh, in, into some of the facilities, the availability of shots, the medical personnel that can administer them uh, for those who want it. Short of that, and it may be short of that, uh, we, we just encourage people to avail themselves. It seems like the supply is increasing. There are some states now that are offering to everybody over 16 years of age. There are other states that have at least moved us up back into the 1B category that CDC said that postal workers as essential workers should be part of. Uh, but unfortunately, it's harder for individuals to find their way through this uh, chaos than it would be if we could get some planned, organized, concerted, uh, 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 vaccine drives in some of the post offices themselves. We're still going to work on that, uh, but right, right now people are doing the best they can. I said earlier, and we're very proud of them, some of the locals were able to arrange some things with the local entities to try to get some, uh, some of that done, and we hope that that will spread. Our, our position is simple. As essential workers, we should be right up there. We, we don't want to be in competition else. We, we understand there are other essential workers and healthcare workers. We should be right up there. We, we don't want to be in competition with anybody else. We, we understand there are other essential workers and healthcare workers, our teachers, our, our transit drivers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But we have got to be up there as essential workers, not just for our protection, but we also deal with the public. So it helps when we're better protected, it helps protect everybody. And someday we'll have, uh, hopefully not too much in the future, we'll have a, a, a Medicare for all system that can deal with a pandemic better and can deal with the question of how to deal with vaccines a lot better. This has been chaotic and we need to learn. One more question. I'm sorry, Judy, go ahead. I just want to end by saying be on the look for the. Uh, it's going to be April the 8th. And we're going to be fighting for uh, the PRO Act. So, Stephen, I know there's more questions. I promise people approximately an hour. I think we want to stick to it. We get to come back. Uh, we very much appreciate just a few close, close end of the month in April. We're not quite in April. It'll be tomorrow, end of the month, April 28th, Workers Memorial Day, a day to, to recognize the 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 have suffered, but more importantly, as Mother Jones said, the and fight like hell for the living. This year of pandemic has understood just how important the health and safety fight is. So you'll have more information. Uh, we want to do the slogans. Check out the Grand Alliance uh, website if you're interested. And 
involved with these fights, especially the fight around voting rights and the fight around workers' rights. Uh, and with that, we appreciate uh, everybody getting on. We wish you well in the day-to-day -day battles as postal workers and the day-to-day -day battles of building the uh, strongest union and moving forward together. Uh, later in the year, and it's not too far off, July 1st, our birthday, 50, 50 years uh, of five unions merged into one. I wish it had been everybody, and maybe in the next call, we'll talk a little more about that because we're going to have some happy anniversary celebrations, not just to look back, but mainly to look forward, build on those who came before uh, and, and continue the battles ahead, and together we'll, we'll continue to win. So thanks all. Solidarity forever. Take care.